We often fall into the trap of belief that church growth is predictable and within our control. Now, there's nothing wrong with good, long-term biblical planning. We should be doing these things. We should be deliberating upon them. But if we think that church growth, actual real church growth, is simple and is under our control, well, we're just fooling ourselves. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 1 to 9 and 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Verses 18 through 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in another, sixty, and in another, thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is wonderful to be back here today. I had a nice uh, sabbatical break. I took a month off of church work and had a nice break out of the seminary. And when I returned home, I uh, had a garden to attend to. Have any of you ever had a garden and you left it alone for a month? <laughs> That was my reality when I returned home. It was a forest and it took many hours of work. I tell you that now because I'm going to bring back that idea in a few minutes. Our text from this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. And this is a, such a blessing because Jesus himself explains it to us. He explains it there in the scriptures, what this means. This parable in Jesus' day in context is answering the question of why. Despite the words and deeds of Jesus, why are there so many people in Israel who are not responding in faith or in discipleship? We can ask ourselves the same question today. He answers that question for us. Despite the words of Christ and the deeds of the church, why are so many people in our families, in our communities, in our nation, who are now responding in faith and discipleship? There are four parts, or rather, places of this parable. There are four places that the seed is sown. The seeds that fall onto the path, the seeds that fall onto rocky ground, 
the seeds that fall into thorns, and the seeds that fall into good soil. The seeds that fall onto the path are immediately devoured by birds, never having the chance to grow. This is like the people and our friends and families who have not received the message because someone or something has taken them away from it. Much like trauma happening early in one's life, any form of abuse, physical, mental, sexual, etc., that happens so early that it causes so much pain that they would not believe. This is one example of the seeds falling onto the path and being trampled or devoured by birds, or rather, Satan. The second, the seeds that fall on rocky ground that spring up quickly, but they soon wither and die. This is like those who hear Jesus preaching and initially believe and follow him, but for whatever reasons, they do not put down deep roots into Jesus, into the truth, into the church of Christ. And when they experience difficulties or oppression or tribulations, they turn away. They no longer live as his disciples. I compare this much to youth events. Youth events are very good and should be done, but uh, many youth go on these events, and there's this high point, it's this emotional high, where they are like, yes, I'm on fire for the Lord, but then they come back home, back to their parents or their siblings, and fighting in school and bullies, and then it's much more difficult to stay in the Word. The roots are not deep enough. The third one, the seeds that fall into the ground alongside thorns. This is like the people who initially hear and believe and follow Jesus, but they get distracted and choked off when wealth, fame, fortune seduces them. And the general worries of life in this fallen age slowly asphyxiate them fixates the hope and joy in their lives brought to them by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've seen many people change, especially when they receive a large inheritance of some kind, or perhaps they get that large pay increase, or they become the head coach, in my experiences, or they become the president of some company. These things slowly begin to choke and kill that faith that was growing. The fourth one, finally, some good news. The seeds that fall onto good ground, and they produce great results. One single seed, some 30 times, some 60 times, some 100 times of itself. Why the variance, though? God's will. Who is to say what God does? The way that this parable is framed lends us to see the character of Jesus as unexpected, yet extravagant. How many of you have a garden at home, or have had gardens at home? Some of you, yeah, a couple of you. How would you plant seeds? You go out there, you see thorns, you see weeds, you see paths, and you're like, here you go, everywhere. Seeds everywhere. That is not how I plant my garden. It's how it sort of ended up one year, because I got upset, but it's neither here nor there. Many of us will compost, we'll dig holes, we'll layer with mulch, we'll place trellises and other such things in preparation for the fruit that is to be grown from the seed sowing. Jesus, in this parable, who is the sower, mind you, he casts seeds with a with without apparent regard for where it lands. If it lands by the thorns, if it lands on the path, if it lands on the rocky ground, it does not matter because Jesus invites to himself all who labor. All. He calls all to, all sinners to repentance. He indiscriminately broadcasts the seed, that being the gospel. To our minds, this is not very efficient. Jesus, it's not very uh, good use of our resources or our efforts. Why would you sow seeds where they may not thrive? This 
The way that God does it is not, in our minds, the most productive or efficient way to operate. But that's how it is with the reign of God. Grace trumps efficiency. The parable of the sower is about the fact that Jesus' own ministry is not being very successful. You think if anyone was going to have the most success, it would be Jesus in that day, but they rejected him. Many people whom Jesus encounters, sits with, reaches out to, has dinner with, they turn away from him. The parable also reveals why this is happening. Now, there are many appropriate applications of this parable for the context of the first century, as well as our context today here in the 21st century. Firstly, when the gospel is being proclaimed, that is, the seed being sown, it will not always work, parentheses, work, in the sense of attracting droves of believers and not inciting opposition. Jesus, in this parable, is teaching us that it is helpful in our understanding how something like church growth works. Often, in our very capitalistic American mindset, we think that if we put X effort in, we'll get Y results out. We often fall into the trap of belief that church growth is predictable and within our control. Now, there's nothing wrong with good, long-term biblical planning. We should be doing these things, and we should be deliberating upon them. But if we think that church growth, actual, real church growth, is simple and is under our control, well, we're just fooling ourselves. There is a sad reality within this parable. You can be doing it right. By the grace of God, you can be doing it right faithfully baptizing children, faithfully teaching your families the Word of God, faithfully receiving the Lord's Supper, faithfully learning, marking, and inwardly digesting the Word of God, and still, for many people who you minister to, there will be no faith, no understanding, no discipleship. God gives the revelation of Jesus himself to all. He casts the seeds wide, but they must stop closing their eyes. And this is the point of the parable. We have a humbling, sobering realization that we must have an attitude of utter and complete dependence on God. My garden at home that I mentioned at the start, I weed it. I weeded it for eight hours that first day when I came back. I water it when it gets too dry. But God does the growing. My garden at home and the faith that is sown in all of us can only be grown by God. It can be choked out. It can be dried out. It can be eaten by birds. But the only growth these seeds can truly have is from the Lord himself. A second application of this parable, it is joy. How many of you have ever planted a tomato plant? Some of you, yeah? Tomatoes are notorious for coming back year after year. Well, I have in my garden what I believe to be third generation tomato plants. They won't go away. <laughs> I love them. I eat much of their fruit. But they've yielded so much in previous years that I can't pick them all. They fall onto the ground. They sow again, and they keep going. Every year, there's more tomato plants that are growing in wild places, places where I didn't want them to grow, mind you, in my very German, organized fashion. In the same way, God grows understanding and faith. There will also be an abundant yield of spiritual produce. So much that for generations they can trace it back to that seed. Perhaps it was the faith of your grandparents when you were younger that helped. Or your parents, or your co-worker, or by God's grace, maybe even a pastor. 
This parable reminds us that the Word of God has the power to create the response of good works of all kinds in the lives of the faithful. God has done it all. <clears throat> Excuse me. A third application is that we can marvel at the generosity of God. He has cast his gospel wide for all, even places that we in this fallen world do not believe that it should be cast. But he does. I've mentioned this last time I was here. I uh, went to Grand Valley for my undergrad. The seed of the gospel was spread there during my time. Even though many come up with excuses to not spread the gospel on these college campuses, too much work, too hard, too many people to all minister to. Too often we think of the many excuses that cause us to stop doing the good work. But Jesus is telling us that he, Jesus, casts the gospel wide and for all, regardless of whether or not it may or may not grow. He indiscriminately casts the gospel. We see his grace and his generosity here. The final application that I could think of in this is that we are to live in wisdom and discernment. The parable clearly divides between those who believe and those who do not believe. The believing in the good soil, the unbelieving in the rocky, the thorny, and those who have been devoured by birds. The disciples of Jesus are by definition and by the power of the word fruitful. That's you and I. We're fruitful. Those who believe, however, us, still live in the world where Satan, persecutions, wealth, and worry are everywhere. You have faith that has been sown in the good soil. You have been forgiven of your sins once again today. Continue to surround yourself with and in the good soil that is conductive for your growth. So if you look around your life and you don't see all that much fruit being grown or yielded, use wisdom and discernment to see if there are any weeds that are popping up, any thorns that are choking out your fruit, any places or people that are stomping and devouring the faith that has been given to you, and go and grow in the good soil. Last time I was here, I mentioned uh, my struggle with pornography in my life. Uh, if you weren't here on that Sunday, well, you're now. I, I, uh, from the ages of about oh, 11 to uh, like 23, 24, somewhere in that range, it was the weed that was choking out my life. It deeply impacted me in so many ways. And I've been untangling the mess that that sin had brought me ever since, and will continue to. In the month of June, I mentioned this at the start, I took a sabbatical down to the seminary in Fort Wayne, and it was excellent. Of course, when I came back to my jungle of a garden, I had a lot of work ahead of me. I took hours, I think I counted eight hours of work, to de-weed it all. Our lives are like garden beds. Some of the faith seeds grow some of the faith, these seeds grow into these big plants that yield a hundred times of themselves. Some are smaller plants that yield 60 or 30, but they yield. See, in our lives, God does the growing. And we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, do the weeding. So what sins are in your life that you're ignoring? What parts of your garden bed have you not visited in a long time. At one point while I was weeding, I was looking down at this plant that I did not recognize. I had to call my wife, Kirsten, out to come and tell me what kind of plant this is. I was wondering if there was a return of some plant long forgotten. Well, she told me it was a weed. Some sins in our lives give the impression that they're good, that they belong, but only 
With our careful eyes, can our gardens truly be weeded? In my example, my wife was able to call out a weed. As much as that happens too in my marriage. She say, hey, shouldn't be doing that. Hey, that's a sin. Hey, do this or that. Instead, in all of our lives, we're to look to those around us, but more importantly, to the Word of God that tells us what is a sin and what is not. If you have something in your life that is not bearing fruit, turn to the Word and find out. It will be made clear. You see, this is the hard work of life as a disciple of Jesus. In the parable, Jesus showed us that a great amount of work will be for naught. The sowing of the seed is done widely and for all. It doesn't make sense to us. It's not that efficient, Jesus. But in the mathematical equation of God's kingdom, grace is more important than efficiency. And in our lives, we work to remove the weeds from around us and to tell others of the weeds around them. By the grace of God, does any of this get done? It is all up to Him. We just keep working to keep our sins at bay. The unfortunate part is that the weeds in our lives, the sins, will always find a place to come back. But the blessed part is that our God is generous and filled with grace. He has cast his gospel wide so that even today we can hear it. It is this, Jesus died for you, for your children, for your grandchildren, for your neighbors, for your friends, for your co-workers, for those sitting in the pews next to you. Jesus died for each and every one of us. So repent and believe and receive the forgiveness of your sins each and every day. This is the good news that is spread that causes faith to grow. Hold fast to Jesus and salvation is yours. Keep your lives as free of sin as you can and each and every day repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.